Sponsored in part by Pediatric Associates of Dallas. Pediatric Associates of Dallas has been providing excellence in pediatric medicine since 1971. PAD has locations in Dallas and Plano and is now open seven days a week because taking care of kids is what we do. The following content is not intended as a substitute for professional legal advice, medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your attorney, advocate, physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding any medical or educational concern. Hi, and welcome to Empower Dyslexia show and podcast. I'm Rachel Chambers. And I'm Stephen Urout. And we're here to help you be a better informed partner in education. Uh, on the show, we discuss dyslexia and related disorders, interventions, research. We talk to um, people in the field, experts. And we also discuss um, state and federal policy. Um, so welcome to the show today, guys. Uh, we have a very special guest. We do, we do. Uh, we have uh, Congressman Bruce Westerman all the way from D.C. Washington, D.C., guys. Uh, we're so excited to have you this morning, Mr. Or, I'm sorry, Congressman Westerman. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Rachel, it's great to be on with you. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about something important and uh, what we can do to help overcome dyslexia. Yes, yes. We're very interested in helping all kids in the United States and the really the world, if we could help that do that, um, would be fantastic. Well, I mean, dyslexia is a it's a, it's a worldwide it's a human problem or issue, right? We we have to uh, address this as a as a group. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to make sure that everybody gets the help that they need. So. Yes, yes. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of science behind it, and we know uh, how to correct it. It's just uh, getting things in motion and getting people to do uh, the right thing is really uh, one of the main obstacles in addressing this issue of dyslexia. I totally agree. Um, so, so to begin the show, we are we have our little segment um, that we're going to start. We call it "Most Ridiculous." Okay. So, uh, as we were talking earlier, we, we, we like to make light of some of the m most ridiculous things that we've ever heard uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with, with either educators or other parents or whatever somebody or said about... Or just people, about, that, you know, don't know don't, people exactly that don't know exactly what a reading problem is and what it looks like. And, and what the struggle is. So, we, we've collected a, a plethora of these uh, quotes and, and we've just kind of made fun of it. So <laughs> Yeah, lightly. Um, since you're not in studio, we'll go ahead and draw one for you and read it, and then you can give us what you uh, what your thoughts are. What your thought? Yeah, and we'll go from there. Okay, so I'll read All it right. real quick. Um, okay, so this is it. Dyslexia is not real. Your child does not try hard enough. Your child can't have dyslexia. They speak so well. So what do you think about that? Well, that's. I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, and that, you know that's that's something that's. You hear it repeated over and over, and really it's a, uh, I think it's it highlights to us why there needs to be better information out there and better education uh, so that people understand that dyslexia is a real disability, and there is a, a, a ton of science behind it. Uh, you're obviously familiar with the Shaywitzes up at, yes. uh, at Yale and the work that they've done. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I know them. I've read their book, and uh, you know it's fascinating that the work they've done with um, MRI machines, where they can uh, put a uh, somebody in in there that doesn't have dyslexia, and they read, and the brain fires a certain way, and then they put a uh, patient in that does have dyslexia, and uh, you know the brain just doesn't fire the right way. So there's there's a ton of science behind it. It's a recognized disability, and if somebody ever says it's just um, you know, because somebody doesn't uh, try hard enough, it's because they're they're looking for an easy way out or, or whatever excuse. That's really unacceptable. 
if uh, if that were said about some of the other disabilities, um, people would really get chastised over that. But oh my gosh, there's still I didn't a common think myth about that's out that. there. I never even thought about that, Congressman. Like, yeah, um, like downplaying any of the other disabilities out there like that. Um, yeah. They would just get raked over the coals be in, and be thought of as insensitive, you know. Um, uh, so uh, that's a great point that you bring up. Again, and, and the reason it would be thought of that way is because it is insensitive. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, uh, seriously, when we're. Uh oh. When some of these early diagnoses take place, um, you know, to, to make a lot of it or say it's not real, that's. Uh, that is very intense. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Rachel, why don't you go ahead real quick? Okay. Let's it's knock my, out two real quick. Well, it's, it's my turn. Okay. So, I just picked one. Um, it says, you can cur cure it, sorry, if you can cure it, if you would just read more to your child. So, this is what I have to say about that. I read to my children every night, every morning. I mean, not probably every morning, but every night and then on command <laughs> when they wanted me to read to them. And you know what? They, my daughter and my son, they both had, well, especially my daughter, um, had reading difficulties, you know? Um, so, I mean, I loved reading to them. I even thought about like starting to read books and record them. Um, so just because it was so fun to get into the characters of the book and be animated. And I really love that kind of stuff and the acting and stuff. So, but, um, you know, I think it helped my children because if I didn't read to them, they wouldn't be where they are now, but it is imperative the that they needed the intervention to get over that hump, you know? So, um, I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Let and me. that's a, uh, uh, you know, we, you, you don't use the word cure, but you could use the word um, overcoming. We hear that word uh, used a lot that, you know, you recognize there's a disability, you do the appropriate interventions, and you can overcome the disability. And there are some uh, people that do great things that are dyslexic. I oh. mean, you, you look look through history and you know you've got Einstein, you've got Charles Schwab and the list goes on and on about uh, folks who are, are dyslexic. I've even had a, a CEO of a, of a major company tell me that he recruits and hires dyslexics in his marketing department because he thinks they're uh, they're more creative oh, wow. and that they've uh, because of the way they've had to, to work to overcome their disability uh, he thinks they bring a lot to the table. So it's not something that is going to necessarily uh, set somebody back in life uh, un unless they don't get the interventions that are out there and that are science-based and proven to work. Right. Absolutely. So uh, this one's, this one's uh, pretty hard. Uh, it's a maturity problem due to a summer birthday. <laughs> Retention will help. Oh, Oh my gosh. You know, I was, I was retained in the third grade and, uh, you know, now looking back on it, I think that's the worst thing that you could do as, uh, you know, especially for the, the, uh, social emotional side of it, yeah. that the child in, in second, first, second, third grade gets to see his classmates go Move on, on where he's, you know, he or she is sitting back going, Oh, well, I guess I'm, I really am. That's when that, that doubt or that, that self-worth really starts right. coming Your self -esteem in. Your self-esteem is affected. Oh, I, I guess I am stupid. Yeah. Right? No, my, my brother and um, my dad were both retained. Um, I think my brother was in second grade and my, I'm not sure what grade my dad was, but yeah, he told me that he had to, he was held back. So it's, it's, it's difficult um, on them, you know? So. Yeah. And I've, I've heard so many people talk about, you know, people who are dyslexic talking about feeling a, a shame because they uh, because they knew something was not right. Uh, but when they finally figure out or are educated that this is a real disability, it's not anything you can uh, you caused or you can help. It's not because you're lazy, not because of uh, of anything else. Uh, you know that helps them to get the confidence and uh, do work harder on the interventions and, and really do better at overcoming the disability. You bet. You bet. So uh, thank you for, for doing our little most ridiculous segment. Um, I got to the privilege of meeting you uh, last year in D.C. Uh, when you took over the co-chair um, position. 
Um, was that dyslexia on the hill? Is the, that what yeah. it's called? And it's every summer, right? Yeah. You went sometime in July, yeah, right? July, and this year it's July 9th. July 9th. So if anybody wants to go this year, Stephen's planning on going and his family. I'm going to try to go. Um, um, try very hard to go. Um, but that's when you met uh, Congressman, Congressman Westerman. Westerman. Yes. So I was on the parent, parent panel mm -hmm. that was uh, testifying or talking. Um, so yeah. I've, I've watched a lot of your videos on, on YouTube, uh, and, and you're a, a, a champion for um, those of us with dyslexia. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about uh, why you're so passionate about dyslexia and tell us uh, a little bit about um, what your drive is around that? Yeah, well, Steve, the way it, it started, um, I guess my first uh, introduction to it. I served on a school board that was the first uh, elected office that I was ever in, and I was just uh, taken aback by some of the low reading scores. And it wasn't just at the school that uh, that I was at. It was it was in a lot of different schools. And um, you know, the real passion for dyslexia intervention in in my family comes from my wife, who is a special education teacher, who has. Uh, actually going back to graduate school and, and done uh, additional education on uh, reading intervention. So she, um, you know, she's the, one of the biggest advocates I know of for addressing this uh, disability. And uh, I went from the, from the school board into the Arkansas legislature and realized we had some issues there. And we, we actually uh, were able to pass the first dyslexia law in the state that I was a, a co-sponsor of that just simply said you had to screen children uh, for dyslexia. Uh, and as you all know, you know, diagnosing the problem is one thing, uh, treating the problem is, is another thing. And that's where you run into the most of the roadblocks are with the, the interventions. And you really, uh, we, we found ourselves going up against uh, a lot of times an educational establishment that was rooted in the uh, colleges of higher education uh, in the education colleges and uh, you know different kinds of whole language programs that were out there that really don't work for uh, kids with dyslexia or uh, kids without dyslexia and there's so much headroom there for improvement i couldn't learn, agree more learn to read better yeah, yeah. So, so, so uh, yeah, from, from there, I uh, went to Congress and found out there was a dyslexia caucus. And, and my wife, uh, every time uh, she talked to me, she would say, have you joined the dyslexia caucus yet? <laughs> so I, I got on that real quickly. <laughs> of course, Lamar Smith from Texas, he was a, a huge advocate for uh, dyslexia. And he was the, the House chair of it. He retired from Congress last year, and I took over as the uh, the co-chair in the House on the Dyslexia Caucus. And you know, we continue to uh, do events uh, back here in Arkansas. We do events in D.C. Uh, one thing that that I found that works well is to find schools that are using proper reading instruction, uh, who are uh, really addressing this issue of dyslexia. Go to those schools and, and get as much attention for them as possible. Yeah, that's kind of what we've done for Garland, or, you know, with, with Garland ISD, which is a, a suburb of Dallas. They've kind of changed their whole way, of, their whole approach to the dyslexic students in their um, ISD. And, and it was a very big positive change. Um, so we had a whole show just devoted to that. <laughs> um, uh, you talked about that. It's, it's amazing when you go into one of these schools that they're using the correct instruction and doing it right. The results that they're getting, not just with the, uh, uh, it's not just the kids uh, who, are, who have dyslexia that are benefiting from it, it's the whole student population. And I mean, we're seeing um, schools achieve 80 and 90% plus uh, reading efficiency or proficiency wow. uh, when they implement these programs. So it's, uh, it's real evidence that if you address it properly, you can make great strides. That's a huge leap because I've seen reports that have said, you know, below 50 percentile on like for their whole student population, they're at like 45, 50 percent on reading at grade level. 
for the whole school, not just like the 15 to 20 percent that may or may not be dyslexic. I just talked to uh, a lady yesterday that was saying that 23 percent, 23 percent pass their reading uh, state assessment. Whoa. But. Uh, yeah, they had well, such a high. They had a really high percentage of their graduation and honor roll. Oh, okay. <laughs> how how that, that works? That, I don't know. How does that happen, guys? Twenty-three percent are reading efficiently, yep. or on grade level. But wow. Okay, I, I didn't make sense to me. Well, what what we what we found in Arkansas is the uh, uh, you know go back five years, six years ago and you would have inflation of scores and the standardized test were, uh, you could play with the numbers on those. But uh, we, we got a new governor in Arkansas, Governor Asa Hutchinson, whose wife is also an, an advocate for, uh, uh, for reading and literacy. And uh, he implemented a program here called the, the RISE Initiative along with working with the state legislature to build on the work that we had done before. And I, I think Arkansas is really going to um, be an example to the rest of the country. And one of the first things was to realize, you know, what's your real literacy rate? Mm -hmm. And we found that, you know, statewide, the, the scores were, uh, were really, really poor, um, you know, much lower than the, the 60 and 70 percent that they thought they had. And once you address the, the problem and then you start researching it and find out that there is uh, science-based reading instruction and, uh, you know, through this RISE initiative, uh, they're creating community partners. Uh, one thing that, that my wife works on uh, a lot is Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. Okay, I love which, Dolly uh, gives, Parton. I mean, I, I would love, oh, yeah. I mean, she is my, like, I don't get starstruck, but I'm pretty darn sure I would be completely <laughs> starstruck by Dolly Parton because I grew up with her and I love her. So I'm just, so I'm just happy that you even said her name because really. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got, I got a better, I've got a better story than that, Rachel. Oh yeah. So, I want to hear. Last year, uh, the Dolly Parton Imagination Library gave away their 100 millionth book. Now that, that in this state that number 100 millionth book wow. they gave away I just so got at the library of congress <laughs> in in dc they had an event to honor dolly and uh, i got to go there and uh get, got to meet her and uh she she's the um, real deal isn't read, she yeah she read her book coat of many colors and sang uh -huh. the song it was it was fantastic i got a picture with her that she signed and i've got it uh -huh. hanging on my office wall in DC. I do have her autograph and I have it hanging in my daughter's room because we went to her concert and so we hung out after the show like total groupies <laughs> and <laughs> they one person I guess took pity on us and um, gave my daughter a, an autograph picture of Dolly Parton so it's hanging in her room. She's right such now. a nice, she nice really is. person too. She Just is. a pleasure to, to visit with. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Washington and I heard about uh, Washington DC when I heard about the uh, dyslexia caucus I was mm -hmm. like what what are you talking about I've like, never heard of it until you mentioned it right. I didn't know about it so. so so you know obviously I had to dive into yeah. figuring out what like it you is do. right yes. um, so for our our viewing um, audience out here can you explain to them what the dyslexia caucus is number one uh, what kind of um, uh, initiatives that they're taking up right now and the last part of it would be if their representative is not on the dyslexia caucus how do we get them on it yeah how can we help okay yeah so a, a caucus is simply a, a, a group of members who sign up to kind of it's kind of like being in a club a specialized club um, uh, and they're usually issue based and they're lots of caucuses in, in Congress, but the Dyslexia Caucus obviously focuses on uh, dyslexia. And again, you know, Lamar Smith has been very instrumental uh, in the Dyslexia Caucus. Senator Bill Cassidy, who's a huge uh, uh, voice for dyslexia, mm -hmm. uh, is, is part of the Senate Dyslexia Caucus. And we do have events in DC like Steve attended. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, some of the things we've done in the past, uh, Representative Smith, he 
had a bill called the Reed Act that we got passed, and it uh, designated uh, a couple million dollars for re research in dyslexia. Uh, Stephen, I think the the event you went to is where we actually talked about uh, the Reed Act, and I know I, I did an event back in Arkansas where uh, I gave folks an update on some of the research that had had come out from the Reed Act, and we were able to. Uh, live stream some of the researchers to actually talk about the research that they were doing. Um, you know, they're constantly finding out more things and more, more ways to help uh, people who are dyslexic. Uh, but again, what we find is it's, uh, it's not necessarily being able to diagnose it, to understand how to address it, but to implement uh, the interventions to help people overcome it. Uh, so the, the READ Act, uh, that was kind of a first step. Uh, Senator Cassidy has filed a bill uh, this year where we're promoting screening uh, in prisons, screening for dyslexia. I know in Arkansas, they they passed a bill in the state legislature uh, to screen for dyslexia. I was uh, had the opportunity just this week to talk to the commissioner of education in Arkansas, a guy named Johnny Key, who I served with in the Arkansas legislature. And he told me that uh, the, uh, I think he said 80% of the prison population test positive or show signs of dyslexia. Yes. So there was a, there was so, a study, there was a study in 1999 um, around the Texas uh, inmate population. Yeah, UTMB, uh, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston did the research. Um, so they said that 80, over 80% 80 were what they called functioning illiterate. Um, obviously that means they can, they can go around, they can go about their day, they can function, but they can't read or write. And then um, they also said that 40, uh, 43, Three, 45 percent, yeah, 43, 45 uh, percent of the Texas inmates were dyslexic. Um, and this was in 99. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they did a, uh, a revamp of the study and it was up to 53 percent of the mm -hmm. Texas population, uh, inmate population has dyslexia. So, you know, right. that's just Texas, you know, sad. Texas has been a leader in uh, in dyslexia. Uh, a lot of the stuff we did in Arkansas when I was in the legislature, we, we copied from what Texas has done. But uh, now you're, you're probably familiar with Amir Baraka and his story yes. about growing up in New Orleans. Yes. Um, there's some, some dynamic speakers out there who tell the story of how they ended up in prison, uh, got the intervention they needed in prison. But think what we could do uh, you know, to affect people's lives in a positive way if we just uh, gave them the instruction they needed at an early age uh, so that they didn't have to go to prison uh, to get the, the help they need for the disability. Absolutely. And that's, um, it's better, it's better to, 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 to give the intervention before than to try to when give intervention you, to a broken person. Yeah, when because, they've made bad choices, dropped out of school because they kept hitting their head against the wall and then dropped out of school for whatever reason – because they're tired of it, and then made a series of bad decisions because they feel so bad. Well, there are survivors. Themselves. You know, people that Most have definitely. dyslexia, the majority of them are great survivors, and they're going to do whatever they have to do that's right or wrong. They're going to do whatever they have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. they've, they've been a failure their entire life. They have social-emotional issues for that piece of it. Right. They don't have an education. They can't get a job. You know, why are people surprised that you know, they end up where they end up. Mm -hmm. I mean, including myself, you've heard time and time again, people that, that didn't get the intervention, if we didn't have the, the, the support at home or the support for some teachers or whatever, we will all say we would have ended up dead or in jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And there's just, um, the, the stories are, I think, what illustrates it better to, to people who don't understand the disability. Uh, so the more we can tell those stories and make it personal, I think the better uh, they'll better understand. Yeah. This we'll have in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. That's why we're here. <laughs> well, that's like Spencer. Um, we had Spencer on. Yes. What a couple weeks ago, 
And you know, he played in the NFL. He's now a motivational speaker. He travels all over the world. Um, he's actually in, in um, Alaska right now doing a mentoring program. He says the same thing. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for football and his coaches, he would be he would have been dead or in jail. Mm -hmm. It's sad. It's sad. I have a story. Um, again, this is a, a person very successful in business. Um, he was a, a single parent. His daughter was in second grade, struggling with, with reading, and uh, her her name was Emily. And he said that uh, you know how kids can be they 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 call me impard and. Uh, he said they just broke his, broke his heart. He said what really got him, and I think he started telling herself that. Um, and I, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, I don't know if you could reposition your your phone or something. It, it's kind of muffled. We're not getting a good reception. Okay. Oh, there you Is go. This there we go. Yes. That's better. Okay. Thank you. Could you repeat all that? Because I didn't really understand it. Yeah, uh, a guy I know, very successful in business single parent, had a daughter in second grade, and uh, the kids at school were calling her uh, M-Tard. Her name was Emily, oh. but they nicknamed her M-Tard because she couldn't couldn't read, and he said that, you know, that broke his heart, but he said what really got him was when she started calling herself that. So, on his own, not knowing anything about dyslexia, he started researching it, and he, he taught her uh, to read, and he's pretty humorous guy the way he tells stories but he said that uh, I guess at work she made a 36 on her uh, ACT and she was a junior at Harvard when wow. he was telling me the story there you go wow that's awesome that's a good I mean, success story yeah and that's not that's not the way it always turns out uh, fortunately she had a parent who was that invested in her and, and did everything he could to help her uh, on his own well, when I talk to schools um, and administrators, I, I tell them all the time that if you're speaking to a parent of a child who's dyslexic, the chances of you speaking to a dyslexic at that point in time are very high. Mm -hmm. You know, and they right. and if they have a child at this point, uh, they probably didn't get the intervention that they needed, uh, and they they are still dealing with the you know those pieces of it. So we need to you know, that's the, that's our tagline working to be a better partner in education. We need to make sure that we're explaining the, the, uh, the solution that we're going to implement to help our children mm -hmm. and know that these parents need as much help as the children do to understand and how to navigate these waters. That's, I agree. Right. And, uh, you know, the biggest advocates that I've seen, um, to address this issue of dyslexia are parents of children who are dyslexic and you know they will do the research they will do the work and m most times they understand the issue better than uh, most administrators and teachers do unless yeah. those administrators and teachers have a specific interest in that area yeah so you definitely I, have to be the smartest person in the room when you go into these meetings you got to know your stuff forwards and backwards because you know a lot of times these these uh, people that are sitting across the table from you they're gonna repeat what they've been told in their, you know, their their lunch and learns or their lessons or whatever it is that they have to go workshops workshops that they go deal with yeah. dyslexia and you know the the people pushing the uh, whole language that um, that doesn't address dyslexia yes. it goes back to higher education that we talked about earlier and you can't I mean these teachers have gone through college and nobody's ever talked to them about dyslexia so it's uh, um, you can kind of understand why when a parent comes up and starts talking to them about this disability that they, they oftentimes have blank stares. But that's one of the things we're addressing uh, in Arkansas. They've, there's been a law passed uh, that requires uh, science-based reading instruction through the, the uh, education colleges. Oh, good. Because that's where, uh, yes. It, it, it met with some resistance, but I think uh, that's being overcome as well now. Oh, good. It's very good to hear because um, I, I hope people, I've talked to some educators that like at University of Texas um, professors, and I'm like, what is your dyslexia? I mean, where is it in your curriculum for, you know, all of our education majors out there? Because, I mean, when you're serving you know, like 
our kids and uh, are teaching our kids and you have 15 to 20 percent whatever that real percentage is um, that have dyslexia how how do they know are you teaching them what it is because that's a large percentage of their student population um, from kindergarten or pre-k let's say pre-k now because i think that just passed in texas um, so from pre-k to 12th grade they, everyone, you know, primary, secondary, and even college, they need to know what it is and be able to identify it and then send them to the, the right direction um, or, right. or do some kind of implementation, in, in, uh, like accommodations and maybe some implementations in the classroom. Yeah. And, you know, it's cliche, but the saying you, you learn to read and then you read to learn, um, mm -hmm. think of how a lot of kids are being cheated out of the learning process. Um, in the higher grades because they weren't taught properly how to read in the lower grades. Right. I mean, it's just common sense, and it's it's bad for our society when we don't address an issue that affects as, as much as one in five people. Right. It, it, it's maddening that we, that we preach and preach and preach the importance of reading, and you must go to school, and you need to know how to read, and you need to do this, and then when it comes to the people – that need to understand and, and learn how to read properly, the balls drop. Right. So I don't, all right, um, let's go to uh, number four. Question okay, number four. so so here's the question. Um, what is the Dyslexia Caucus? What, what are you guys uh, uh, talking about for 2019, 2020? Is there any new legislation at the federal level? Um, or, or so, yeah. so what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, Rachel, I mentioned, I mentioned earlier that uh, Senator Cassidy has a bill that would uh, uh, require screening for dyslexia in the prison system. Yes. Um, now, you have to realize, again, that when we make a federal law, it affects the, the federal government. Uh, most people who are in prison are not in federal prison. They're in state prison. So True. a lot of what we do uh, for dyslexia at the federal level is hopefully set an example that states will follow. Uh, you know, it would be great if every state in the union screened for dyslexia in prison. Uh, it would be great if every state in the union screened for dyslexia uh, in the early years so that they could address the issue uh, on the front end instead of at the back end. Uh, so uh, that's what we're working on. This Congress is to try to get another bipartisan bill out there on dyslexia screening in the, the federal prison system. Okay. It, well, in Texas just passed uh, last legislative session, um, I believe, uh, to screen in kindergarten first, second grade. So we've now started uh -huh. doing that and they're implementing it now, which is good. We're yeah. moving in I mean, the right direction. Yeah. 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 And. Uh, you know, there, there are several states that have put that in place, which is a good thing and shows that we are making progress. So um, I know on the Dyslexia Caucus website, it, there's a list of all the uh, representatives that's, that's uh, a part of the caucus. If uh, our representative is not on that list, uh, how do we approach them or talk to them or get them on that list or get them on the caucus? I mean, is there, is there a sign up? I mean, do they... <laughs> Sign of genius. Yeah, yeah the, <laughs> you know, the, the best way for that to happen is for somebody to visit with them and explain um, dyslexia and explain the caucus and ask them to join. Uh, you know, most members want to work on issues like this, but a lot of times they just don't know about them. So, uh, you know, if you can go to D.C. and schedule an appointment with your representative and and explain to them, you know, what the Dyslexia Caucus is and, and why they should join it. And there are groups that, that go to the Hill, uh, you know, at designated times, and then people just, uh, they may be in D.C. for something else and schedule an appointment with their congressman. And you can always uh, reach out through social media or email or even the old-fashioned way of writing a letter or making a phone call. Awesome. So... You know, there, you talked about there's a lot of groups that go up there, and that's what people think of. Is there's, you know, lobbyist groups or whatever that come up, and they're the only people that get heard. Uh, from what I just heard, our representatives really want to hear from the average person. The people. The people. Not, yeah, not well, just, I tell people all the time, the, the best lobbyist out there is your constituents. 
you know, people that you're representing. Uh, you, know, you don't have to be a paid lobbyist to lobby your member of Congress and, uh, you know, scheduling a visit with them or, or calling them. Uh, that's, um, that, that's really grassroots lobbying in the way that it should be done. You know, organizations that are, that are more organized and, and have budgets, they can pay somebody full time to go have those meetings. But to me, it's a lot more effective if one of my constituents uh, visits with me about an issue because I know it's something that's uh, important to somebody that I'm representing in Congress. So, Very cool. So I'd love to hear that. That means your voice is heard. Make sure that you, you know, reach out to your representatives, uh, state and federal representatives, set up a meeting, go talk to them about uh, these concerns and what we need to do to, to help out and be that better uh, partner, right? right? We have right. to be the partners. Uh, it takes a, it takes, you know, that old saying, it takes a village, right? Yeah. And, and that's what we need. We need everybody be on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. So with that being said, how can we, the public, better support you uh, in, you know, the, in the Dyslexia Caucus in Washington? Well, I mean, what you're doing with this uh, podcast here, that's a great way to, to get the word out. And, uh, you know, it's really just spreading the, the message and making more people aware. Uh, it always helps when you're, you're working on something and you're on the right side of the issue and you've got the science and the facts behind you. So, uh, you know, people, we live in a society where you can uh, drive through and uh, get your food quickly. You can order a movie off the Internet. It's kind of a uh, we want to see quick results, but some things take longer to get results and people get discouraged because things don't happen as fast as they would like to see them happen. Uh, but we can't can't give up on that and just have to continue working. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of times on these uh, Facebook pages that people ask, what are the best apps? What's the best app for for my child with dyslexia? Right. Like, well, this is going to be a little bit more than just an app. I understand you're wanting to yeah. do everything you can to make sure that your child gets help, but you know, we need to make sure that it's it's all, it's a uh, systematic uh, approach to getting them the help that they need. Um, yeah, my wife is uh, she she doesn't teach in the public schools anymore, but she she volunteers her time to help uh, kids in our community uh, who have dyslexia, and you know it's a it's a long process. You're talking about a year or two of, of tutoring. Uh, a couple of times a week to get through the program, but it, it sure does her good to see the progress that's made. And, uh, you know, it's not helping the masses when she does that, but it, it sure makes a difference in those kids' lives that oh, she's able bet. to help. You bet. I th and um, our, our producer, uh, I believe, has a question for you. Is that right, Ziggy? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Congressman, uh, I, I'm i not <laughs> personally... Uh, I don't have dyslexia, and I don't. Uh, until I started producing the show, I've never really met someone with dyslexia. And you mentioned earlier uh -huh. that most of the the strongest advocates are uh, people who have dyslexia or the parents of children with dyslexia. People that find themselves personally affected. Uh, do you find it uh -huh. hard to uh, advocate for dyslexia education and interven intervention to people that haven't really experienced this or uh, find it? more in an abstract sense? Is that a difficult thing to, to do? Well, it may be at first, but once they understand the issue, they most people kind of have an, an aha moment. And, uh, you know, the, the data that's out there on the, the literacy rates across our country, people know there's a problem. And, and this is a huge part of it. So, um, again, when you're using the, the science and you're uh, using the data. It's not that difficult to convince somebody who may have never been uh, uh, personally affected to understand that everybody wins if we address this issue. Everybody wins. That's right. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody. Well, uh, Cong Congressman Westerman, uh, I want to thank you for all of the tireless, uh, tireless, uh, tireless, <laughs> Continuous. tireless is the word. My, okay. dysle my dyslexia is acting up. Sorry. Uh, work that you're doing uh, for us and um, constantly bringing awareness to our dyslexic population. Um, I can't thank you enough. And 
um, thank you for coming on our show. Yeah, we would really, really appreciate it. And, you know, encourage well, all been... of your, your, your friends up there in D.C. to keep doing the work like what you're doing because it really benefits our – it really benefits the United States. You know, honestly. Well, it's a it's a it's a team effort, and a lot of people are are doing a lot of work in a lot of different places, and that's how we will get results. So, uh, thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for having a show that addresses <laughs> this, and uh, uh, thank you again for all the work that, that you all are doing. And uh, God bless you, and have a great day. Okay, thank you, you so too. much. Thank you. Wow, that was a great interview. It was. I was so I'm so happy that he was able to make time to come on our podcast and just well, explain what the Dyslexia Caucus is and and um, what they're doing. I mean, it, again, it shows that um, the the constituents, the, the the people that are here, really do have a voice and they want to talk yes. to you. They want to understand what issues that um, they need addressed. Mm -hmm. at the federal and at the state level, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't think that your voice doesn't, your voice is not uh, important. Make sure that you go out and talk to them. Right. Set that meeting up. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've done that a uh, lot. A lot. <laughs> well, I want to do it more, though. Absolutely. We're coming to town, guys. We're going to go to Austin and hook all you guys up. Okay. So before we leave, I do want to give you all a brief update on what happened this morning. Okay. Um, Jeez. Okay, so dyslexia, or uh, not sorry, Disability Rights Texas held a press conference today, this morning, at the capital of Texas. And basically, they wanted, uh, the Texas Tribune has, uh, which is a newspaper out of Austin, they've reported this. Um, we posted it on our Facebook page uh, last week when it came out. But I, did, I do want to tell you guys about the press conference. Okay, so... Basically, Texas did not spend the money that was allocated um, for special education. So, so real quick, every year the TEA has to uh, apply for a grant Correct. from from IDEA, the federal government, that mm -hmm. says we need X amount of dollars for Correct. our special ed um, departments or our special ed population. And that's that's what that thirty three point three or thirty three point five well, million dollars. That's part of it, right? Right. Well, so yes, they have to apply every year, and this is all new information that I have not been have not I've not been privy to. I just didn't know. You know, you just right. don't know until you know, and they're like, oh. So um, so yes. Yeah, so Texas, the you know the federal government, the U United States Dep Department of Education said, okay, here Texas, here's your money for your special education po population. It's really not that much because we have so many students in, in Texas, but um, Texas failed to spend the money where it was allocated. So the federal government came down, and this is the first time this has ever happened um, to any state. Um, they came down and said, um, we want our money back because you didn't spend the money where you said you were going to spend it. Um, so they went to the Fifth, Cor uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, which is, I think, in Louisiana, and um, TEA said, well, our students just got better. They didn't need the special services. We're doing so good here in Texas that they didn't, we didn't need to spend the money on that or something to that effect. I'm probably being dramatic. But um, so, so basically this is what's come down. Um, we not only owe um, the $33.3 million back to the federal government, it's been – stated that we need to pay back $223 million on top of the $33.3 million so this is that we already years. owe. Yeah, that's from, oh gosh, I don't really remember. I think it's, was it 2012, uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018? No, I mean, I didn't write the, the years down, but um, it's over, I think, uh, either three years or five consecutive years. I can't really remember, so don't quote me on that. But um, so please go to our Facebook site, um, our YouTube, so YouTube site. We're going to have uh, the press conference posted there. I posted it there this morning before the show started. Watch it. Then call your congressman or woman, uh, your state representative, your, your senators, and say, you know, session is almost over. If you guys don't spend the money and figure out a way to fix this, we're gonna get hit again for the next year. So it's 
imperative well, in the, in that the we figure this out now, not in two years when session starts back up again. We have to figure this out before May. The, the people who are getting hurt are the kids. Well, and also all of the kids, not just the special education kids or not just right. the kids in, in, in accommodations. We're talking about all the kids because those school districts are having to pull the money away from other um, areas. areas of school um, to help give the, the money in into the uh, special education bucket. Right. Because it, it, the state and the federal government is... is and I want to say that... The guys, last I don't number, know. The last number <laughs> I saw was we have 5.5, .5, roughly 5.5 .5 million kids mm -hmm. in a uh, school system in Texas right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we already have a, a, a huge problem with funding, school funding, and now we're... We're, we're in debt. We're settled with this of... What did you, you say? Two hundred and what? Two hundred and twenty-three million. Two hundred and twenty-three. On top of what we already owe, the thirty-three point three million dollars. So, so make sure you reach out to your representatives, state representatives, uh, U.S. representatives, and and ask them about this. It has uh, to be done this year. We we need to figure this out. This is like this is, there's only like three or four more weeks left in session. Five weeks. It, it ends Memorial Day, so we have approximately six weeks. To figure this out and this isn't something that's going to take a one day and let's vote and woohoo it's done it's going to take lots of lobbying to all of congress and um, the house of rep and the, the senate to get them to fix this so and, your voices are needed <laughs> and again this is not the rachel made a good point this is not something that's going to be fixed overnight this isn't a problem that will, they haven't that, even started talking about it yet this I'm isn't not a sure. problem I, that I started think. overnight right this isn't a problem that's going to be fixed overnight but we need to make sure we're addressing it right now so right we're now. not hit the next year yeah. and the next year. Yeah. We, our, our kids need to be serviced uh, and given the proper intervention, whether they're in special education or 504, whatever it is, or general education, they need to give them the money to make sure our kids are educated properly. Yeah. Yeah. They're breaking it by not funding it. They're breaking it. So Don't let them break it. Okay. Okay. So that's all the time we have today for today's show. Thank you for joining us. We enjoyed having Congressman Westerman on. We appreciate his time. Absolutely. And as we always like to end it, please go get your child tested if you think that there's a problem, because the only way you're going to be able to help your child is to know what the problem is. So go to our website, uh, www.empowerdyslexia.info. I said it right today. And go check out those letter templates that we have on online for you. And remember, you can uh, now hear us on all your favorite apps. If you yeah. just watch or want to listen to our podcast, we're on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa. Oh, I got my Alexa working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there we are. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And be sure to, to subscribe and like us on Facebook. Uh, leave us a, a recommendation if you find this information uh, valuable. Um, we will see you next Thursday. You bet. When we have uh, Dr. Tim Conway. Oh, I, I, I mean, I got goosebumps just now. I can't wait to hear what he has to say for us. This is going to be uh, an amazing, amazing show. Yeah. So don't miss it. We'll see you then. Okay, bye, y'all. Thank you.